Okay, well, um, well, Marcus' philosophy is a, is a large and sometimes uh, complex uh, issue, um, sometimes made more complex than it needs to be by academic studies of it. So, um, what I'm going to try and do is um, give some sort of basic outlines uh, about where Marx's uh, philosophy, in particular his dialectical view of the world, um, came from and some sort of um, ideas about what that, uh, what that entails. Um, so I guess the first thing to do is to try and give some idea about what is suggested, what's meant by um, the term dialectic when we say something is dialectical. And I guess the best way of looking at that is its uh, original origin in, um, in, Greek, in Greek philosophy. Um, uh, a, a dialectic was originally in Socrates and in his pupil uh, Plato, um, the view that knowledge was arrived at um, by the clash or interaction of ideas, that it wasn't simply a, a, a linear uh, a linear process, um, that it was um, a, a process which involved um, conflict and argument. Um, so if you look at uh, the Socratic dialogues or if you look at uh, Plato's The Republic, uh, for instance, it's, it's organised in the form of a dialogue, in the form of an argument. There are a group of philosophers involved in the discussion. It's not assumed, um, in fact it's assumed, uh, it's not assumed that any one of them uh, possesses uh, the truth. Um, it's assumed um, that the truth will emerge through the conflict of ideas, that nobody involved in the discussion at the outset is in possession of it, and maybe partially uh, have a, access to partial truths, but the whole truth about the subject matter will emerge um, through the process of argument, discussion, a conflict and a clash of, uh, of ideas. Um, that fundamental view, um, that fundamental view that you can have access to the truth only through a process of, of conflict and, uh, and, and resolution of conflict, it is taken to a kind of wholly different scale um, by, the, uh, by the German philosopher Hegel. Um, now Lenin famously, when he was reading Hegel, said that reading Hegel's philosophy was the quickest way of getting a headache. Um, and um, I don't want to, it's a warm night, so I don't want to try and induce that sensation in you, um, but it is really unavoidable when we talk about this, and we talk about where Marx uh, developed his philosophical views uh, from. Um, impossible to do that without talking about uh, about Hegel. Now Hegel was a child of the Enlightenment, a child of the period of the uh, of the French uh, of the French uh, Revolution, um, it, and it was from the kind of storms of that period, intellectual um, and political the impact of the, of, of the French Revolution, that Hegel really produced a kind of very much more profound um, version of the idea of the, di of, of, of the dialectic. Now I'll come to the kind of historical aspect of it in a, in a moment, but um, in order to try and frame that and to try and sort of connect it to the idea of uh, the Platonic or uh, Socratic dialogue of, of conflict of ideas, I want to first of all deal with um, something that Hegel did with ideas. And um, uh, one of Hegel's most uh, famous works, the, the Science of Logic, um, asks us at the very beginning of it to try and imagine um, what the most kind of fundamental concept we could possibly imagine is. What concept, what idea must proceed every other single idea or every other single uh, kind of conception that you might have about the world as a starting point. And, um, and what Hegel does is to say, all right, let's imagine, so to say, that everything that we normally think about the world, uh, the, the objects in it, the people in it, the, uh, the concepts in it, let's imagine that all that is stripped away, that every colour, taste, sensation or a smell of any kind is stripped out, what would you then 
be left with? What would be the most fundamental building block that you would have to begin with? And the conclusion it comes to is that you would have to start with the simple idea of being. That's the first category in the science of logic, is the category called being, by which he means existence, simply something <coughs> that exists. Before we say that it exists as wood, as metal, as rough, as smooth, as red, or pink, or blue, that it smells like this or like that, that it simply exists. That this is the most fundamental and basic idea that you can have about something in the world. Um, and then from then, he says, well, okay, um, if this is the most fundamental idea, how do we begin then, out of this simple idea of being, of existence, to draw um, the whole complexity of the universe out, out of this? How does beginning here help us? And he says, well, being that can't exist just on its own. It has to have something that it defines itself against. It can't stand on its own. Once we say being, we are inevitably saying something else as well. And something else that Hegel says we're saying is that we're saying that if something exists, we must already have a concept of non-existence. If we're saying being, we must be able to say nothing. But there's uh, uh, something exists, we must also be able to say that there's nothing, or that there's non-existence. And so he's made what is the first transition in a whole series. The logic is a massive book, uh, consisting of a series of transitions like this, and they're logically entailed. So if you say B, the minute you say existence, that entails within it the idea of its opposite, of non-existence, of nothing. And then he makes a further um, analysis from that, where he says if we have two ideas now, being and its opposite, nothing, then there must be a process which links the two. There has to be a moment where you can go from nothing to something, from nothing to being, from non-existence to existence. And this category he calls becoming, that there's a process. So that is probably the most famous triad in the entirety of Western philosophy. Being, nothing, becoming. That's the first of the famous, you know, anything about the dialectic, you'll know it's supposed to move by thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. That something is, that it contains its opposite, and that there's a relationship between the thing and its opposite, which is the synthesis. And in the, at the right at the beginning of the science of logic, there stands this absolutely enormous kind of triad of being, nothing, and becoming. Now, you know, I know that all that sounds fantastically kind of um, abstract, which indeed it is. That was its point, in a way, that it was abstracted from everything else. That was the purpose of it, to be the foundation of everything that followed. It had to be um, abstracted from everything that existed. And then, then Hegel goes on, and um, I'll show we won't be going through all these, you'll be glad to know. Um, but this is the table of categories from the science of logic. Just up here, we've got the category of being, which divides into being, nothing, and becoming. And then, through all these, um, and all these, and then these, he deduces the whole of the kind of conceptual universe of essence, appearance, measurement, so forth, all the things that we would use as concepts to try and analyze the, the, world, uh, the world around us. Now, as I say, I'm not going to go through all that. You'll be, you'll be pleased to know. Although Hegel's lectures are available, you can follow them as he gave them in various German, German universities. They're printed and, uh, and you can give yourself a headache with those, never mind about the science of logic. Um, but I just want to point out a couple of things about them, about that first triad of the science of logic, which is characteristic of all dialectical thought, all of Hegel's thought, and all of Marx's thought as well. And that is that they involve these concepts. First of all, it involves the idea of totality. That everything that we know is in some way connected. By starting with these very, very abstract ideas, what Hegel is saying is that encompassed in all of these, if we logically deduce, just as we logically deduce the idea of nothing from something, of non-being, from being and then becoming, if we carry on with this process of deduction, we will find out that all the other categories that we use to look at the world, measurement, appearance, essence, all of these are connected in a single deducible uh, whole. 
Um, the second thing that uh, he was keen to point out is just like Socratic dialogue, that these exist in a tension, that there is, a, in a sense, a contradiction between being and nothing, that there is an antagonism here. It's not a, it's not a kind of hippie version of all connectedness. You know, hippies, various world religions, also have the idea that the whole world is in some way connected, either as the creation of God or in you know, James Lovelock's kind of Gaia theory that the whole natural world and human beings are connected. Um, but they are kind of placid totalities. There is no antagonism involved here, or not, not necessarily. But in Hegel, as in Marx, this is a totality. Everything is connected in the world, but it is connected in such a way that it is uh, conflictual, that it is contradictory, that there is an antagonism uh, involved between the, different, uh, between the different parts. And this is what gives it its dynamism. So we have the idea of connectedness, a totality which is connected, a totality which is contradictory, antagonistic at its core, and this is what drives it forward as a process. So it's not a stable totality, it's not an unchanging totality. The totality envisaged by the world's religions are essentially the same over time. There has always been God, there has always been creation, the pattern of the world may superficially change, but the most fundamental things about it remain static. This isn't Hegel's view and it's not Marx's view. This is a dynamic totality and it's a dynamic totality because it's unstable. And it's unstable because it's conflictual and contradictory um, at its heart. Which means that it's a process of development, that it's a process of change that we're looking at. Now these are actually, you know, put like this, they're relatively, seems to me, relatively simple uh, and straightforward and straightforward ideas, but they stand in flat contradiction to most of what we're taught about the world. A lot of what we're taught about the world is that it's relatively stable, uh, relatively fixed, that things aren't processes, aren't subject to change, don't um, have a certain coming into existence and passing out of existence. It's practically axiomatic, for instance, that capital society is here to stay. It's practically axiomatic in the world's religions that God is as he was at the creation and will be uh, to eternity. Um, there are all, almost all um, views of the world like this are relatively static views of the world, the kind of normal scientific procedure until you get to the higher reaches. Uh, of, uh, of science and some of the uh, innovations that, have, that have, have had to have to come as an apprehension of a, of a changing natural world, but very much of it and very much of social science assumes that when you define something, it's going to stay like this. You know, the standard sociological definition of the state, that it is um, the sole legitimate force in a given geographical area. That's the state. And you can go on through this um, for any number of things. Um, and they're perfectly good static definitions up to a certain point, but also, if you look over time, it isn't even true that they're always like this. There hasn't always been a nation state of the modern type, which has the sole legitimate authority over a given geographical area. Medieval France wasn't like this. Um, and in fact, it's a relatively modern, uh, modern uh, invention. So there's an insistence on change. Um, and in Hegel, this was historically rooted. Um, it wasn't just that the categories of logic were like this, as they are, as I described them in the science of logic, but history moved like this as well. That institutions could come into being, that at a certain point they would encompass the spirit of the age, the zeitgeist, that they would be um, uh, vital, that they would match the temper of the age, um, but then at a certain point, um, as Hegel puts it, the spirit of the age would move on and leave the institutions as hollowed out husks. This is what he thought he'd seen, what he had seen in, in the French Revolution, that the French aristocracy, that the aristocracy throughout Europe, that the, uh, the King of France, that these institutions, at a certain time in French history, had been kind of necessary, vital, the only available institutions had become hollowed out by the passage of time and were blown away by the experience of the, of the French Revolution because of the contradiction between what they were when they began, what they embodied when they began, but which had been hollowed out of them with the passage of time and social development, as we would, we would put it. So 
Hegel says at one point that the, the history of the world is not the theatre of happiness. Periods of happiness are blank pages in it. For they are periods of harmony, periods when the antithesis is in abeyance. So what he means there is that it's the contradictions in the society, in the social structure, in the historical process, which make for change. When the antithesis, as he calls it, is in abeyance, when you have a placid period, a period of happiness, as he puts it, rather unfortunately, really, in that, uh, in that, uh, in that quote, these are periods of uh, unchanging um, uh, placidity in the in the social in the social structure. So you can see here the way in which we're beginning to move, even in Hegel, towards ideas which are characteristic of uh, of, of Marxism. And of course, after Hegel's death in 1930, um, both he and Frederick Engels were a part of the Young Hegelian group, a group of philosophers who very much um, took the study of Hegel very seriously, um, by and large rejected the more conservative political positions which Hegel came to hold towards the end of his life, concentrated on the kind of dynamic elements of the dialectical method as they understood them and of their, and of their kind of revolutionary conclusions. Um, one figure in particular are among the young Hegelians, um, uh, a man called Ludwig Feuerbach, um, was crucially, momentarily, but crucially uh, important for Marx and Engels because uh, he was the person who um, insisted most fully that this process wasn't primarily an intellectual for Hegel, this whole process, and even the historical parts of it, were primarily intellectual processes. That the various ideologies, the spirit of the age, as he put it, um, would be the active and transforming element. It would be changes in the kind of what we would later call the kind of ideological superstructure of society, which were the driver of change. And once these intellectual changes had taken place, all the rest of it, as he put it, the canons, the blood, all this flowed after an intellectual. Uh, change. What Feuerbach among the young Hegelians um, was uh, insistent on was that the, the, the changes in the material structure of society were as important and in a certain sense preceded uh, intellectual, I intellectual change. And Engels said we all had to go through this process of suddenly realising that what we'd learned from Hegel was a partial and one-sided understanding of what dialectical change meant and what Feuerbach brought to us was the sudden idea that this was a much wider and deeper and social and historical process even than the idea that we've got from Hegel and uh, he says we all had to pass through the fiery stream which is a kind of German joke because Feuerbach, fire, Feuer is fire, back is stream and then so we all had to pass through the, the fiery stream through Feuerbach's force and although Engels and Marx thought that Hegel was a much greater figure they understood that, uh, or they came to, 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 to the view that it was only really by viewing uh, Hegel through this lens, through the point that, uh, that Feuerbach had made, that they could make an advance historically, politically, uh, philosophically. And I guess the essence of, um, of Feuerbach's idea is captured more exactly by the um, Italian philosopher uh, Antonio Labriola, who was one of Gramsci's, um, Antonio Gramsci, the Italian Marx, one of his great teachers, um, Labriola, and he put it absolutely beautifully. He said that um, ideas do not fall from the sky and nothing comes to us in a dream. Um, by which he didn't mean to diminish the force of ideas or the importance of ideas, but he did mean uh, to point out that they weren't, if you like, supernatural, literally supernatural, that they didn't arise from outside a natural historical social process, but came from within it and interacted within it. Um, and I guess um, that leads you to the whole idea of materialism, that there is a social, historical, uh, economic structure to the, uh, to the world which underpins the development of ideas. Um, and that was a transformation that Marx and Engels made through the experience of interacting with Feuerbach and the other young Hegelians. Um, now this could lead you to the point, and this is often an accusation made of Marxism, that it's a, a deterministic philosophy, that it, that it rests on the idea 
um, that only the economic structure is important. So I just want to, to quote something that Marx himself said because it, 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 we can put that thought aside um, for a moment because although it's a very powerful and long-standing criticism of Marxism, it's um, entirely inaccurate. Marx put it like this, he said, the forces and social relations of production are two sides of the development of the social individual. Nature builds no machines, no locomotives, railways, electric telegraphs, self-acting mules, etc. These are products of human industry. They are organs of the human brain, created by the human hand, the power of knowledge, objectified. So he's pointing to the material environment within which human development takes place. He's saying that it is structured by this environment, but it is not determined solely by this environment, but by the interaction of human beings with uh, their, uh, their environment. Um, and one way of looking at that is to look at how he thought about human labour. And uh, for, um, for Marx, human labour was at the core of understanding what is distinctive about being a human being. And uh, he says at one point, uh, I think actually in Capital, um, that if we compare a bee with the worst human architect, there is a difference. Because even though the bee is capable of constructing a geom geometrically perfect honeycomb, and uh, the architect uh, may well produce a rickety house, the difference between the two is that the architect erects in his mind the image of what he is going to build uh, before he sets to work. The bee acts from instinct. In other words, there is a conscious labour at the heart of what it means to be a human being. The consciousness and labour that ideas and physicality, um, that um, ideas and material circumstance are fused in human beings. Human beings are a fusion of uh, being determined by and dependent on their natural environment, but also consciously interacting with it. And that idea is absolutely critical to Marxism because it's the loss of that capacity to consciously control your environment, which is at the heart of the idea of alienation. Um, alienation, a short definition of alienation, is a loss of control over conscious labor. The control migrates to a different class in the society. Uh, it migrates to the capitalist class. They are the people who will tell you um, what you do, when you do it, how long you do it for, and what will be paid for doing it at the end of the day, and what you'll have to pay to buy the products of your labour back when they appear on the supermarket shelves. So capitalism for Marx is about alienating the one thing that makes human beings human, their ability to consciously control their labour. And one short definition of socialism is that this process is reappropriated collectively by human beings so they're able to consciously control their labour once again. Um, one definition of revolutionary activity is that it is the conscious, it is the one conscious activity which is designed to reappropriate the human ability to consciously control their own labour. That through revolutionary activity we seek to transform the society in such a way consciously to transform the society in such a way that we reappropriate what it means to be a human being, to be able to consciously direct your labour and to construct and control the environment around you rather than having it constructed for you or to have it develop as it does in capitalism blindly and without conscious uh, control by a market mechanism which is beyond, designed to be and is beyond uh, human, uh, human control. So that kind of brings us back to a kind of final point that I want to make, that if we look at the society in this way, if we look at it as a, a totality in which every aspect of it is interlinked, that what happens in the factory is not separate from what happens in the film studio or in the theatre or in the church, um, if we can look at the ways in which those things are related to the central fissure, the central contradiction, the central element of conflict in the society, which can vary over societies, but which in our society is a conflict between wage labour and capital. 
if we can see that this totality produces this contradiction and produces a possibility of consciously transforming the society, we've got one example of what Marx, the central example in many ways, of what Marx meant uh, by, by a dialectic. Now this is a complex process, it's not an easy process. We can't assume that everything can be immediately, this is what reductionism means, what determinism means, that everything that we see around us, from the paintings of Pablo Picasso to the latest sitcom, can be immediately reduced to what's happening in the factory. Now, there's a complex process of mediation, of links between these things, but they are nevertheless connected, even if complex, in, in complex ways. And I'll end with the point that Marx makes about how you analyze things in this way. He says, if I look at the population, this is an abstraction. In other words, it's not a true representation. Even though many people say, oh, looking at population, that's the most basic elementary thing that you can do. But if I look at the population, it's an abstraction. If I admit the classes, for example, of which it consists, those classes are an empty word if I do not know the elements on which they are based, for example, wage, labour, capital, etc. These imply exchange, division of labour, prices, etc. Capital, for example, is nothing without wage, labour, without value, money, price, etc. Therefore, if I begin with population, that will be a chaotic conception of the whole. And through closer determination, I would need to come analytically to increasingly simpler concepts. And from the conceptualised concrete to more and more tenuous abstractions until I arrive at the simplest determinations. From there, the journey will be taken up in reverse until I finally arrive again at population. This time, however, not with population as a chaotic conception of the whole, but as a rich totality of many determinations. You see what he's doing there. He's saying, okay, the world confronts us as an interrelated mass of relationships, but if we want to understand how it works, we have to analytically separate out the, the elements. But then once we've done that, we have to make a reverse process of putting them back together as a dynamic, contradictory uh, totality. And that's, in, in as short a, a, a way as I can, both the way in which he sees contradictions existing in the society and the way in which he sees a method which is appropriate to those. Because one of the very final point I want to make is that the method of analysis has to be appropriate to its object. And if the object is a contradictory class society, if it's an interlinked totality which has a fissure at its heart, which relates to all different aspects of it, which is amenable to change by certain forms of political uh, and economic action, if that's what the society looks like, then it's no good trying to get an access, an insight into that society with a method which doesn't mirror it, which doesn't have the same kind of pattern as it. And when he's talking about the dialectical method of analysis, it's appropriate because the object at which it's looking is constructed in this way. In other words, you can't have a key for a different lock. If the lock is constructed like this, then the key has to be constructed like that in order to open it. And that's why both the idea of a Marxist method of analysis and a Marxist uh, conception, uh, dialectical conception of the reality are two sides of the same coin. Is that the end of philosophy as it was formerly understood? 
If so, what, what do you think about the grounds of CrossFit to continue? Is it still a contested ground? Unlike the maths or physics, where, where you have these, you have these great, you know, Darwin's who tend to set the, the pattern of thing, every kind of thought comes up and has to reference this way. I think it's possibly slightly more chaotic than that. So, how does what, how does Marx's philosophy turn, or does it turn, or do just stay at this kind of level? Um, and also the other point about that is before Marx is like how many hundreds of years of, of thinking in this kind of way was part of development. After that, we only had 150 or 50 odd years. Is there a relationship between? Do you think there's a relationship between Marx's discoveries and the way in which does that prefigure the way in which society is going to change? Because the idea of a of a, a really sort of thoroughgoing social revolution, which I think seems now much more plausible than it even would have seen 100 years ago. You know, the, the level of productivity that society has reached, the obvious gaping inequalities, you can just point, you can say, look at those houses, look at the buildings they're making, Dubai and you know, the slums next door. It's so obvious to make a case for redistribution of wealth. We think that those are kind of revolutionary the fact that Marx is kind of, in one sense, shutting down Western philosophy, is that in somehow indicative of the fact that we are close to a point where the social revolution can happen? Do you think this relationship between the way thought develops and the way society is developing? I take from what you're saying is that everything changes. Uh, did Marx ever sort of say, well, when socialism comes back, that will never change, or will socialism actually also change into something that's different? Uh, if the, the theory is correct, there's contradictions and so on, and everything does change, which is true, and the universe and so on don't change. Did Marx ever say that socialism once real and very common socialism, and would that change in the future? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I didn't elaborate a lot, but, but a very large part of the way in which we're taught to look at the, uh, look at the world is based on essentially static concepts, is, uh, is, is based on um, uh, a model of the world which rules out process change and, con and contradiction. And this, you know, this stems from everyday notions about how the world is organised, you know, the, the, the idea that we have a fixed human nature, for instance, you know, that, and this accounts for the fact that there will always be, you know, you can have a, a beneficent version of the human nature theory, which is basically that people are good and that this will come out in the end, or you can have a malignant version of it, that people are basically evil and this will come out uh, in the end. Uh, you can have different views of what that nature is, that it's avaricious and greedy, or that it's, uh, um, you know, generous and but, but it's fixed. It was like this when we came out of the slime, or at least when we got down from the trees, and it's going to be like this for ever, or for as much as ever as it makes any difference to, uh, to any of us. So that's one very static view of the world. As I said, religious views are uh, essentially static views, uh, views of, 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 the, uh, of the world, but so is a lot of sociological. Uh, sociological uh, theory, and certainly a lot of it is based on fixed compartmentalization of one part of the of what is a, a scientific method of the analytical moment. Think of CSI. That's, you know, that's what they're doing. That kind of that, that kind that kind of that kind of science. So it's a very very predominant view, and the view that the way in which you do this is by breaking things down into their compartments, and the compartments are not in any fundamental way linked together, or if they are linked together, they are linked in a simple additive series, one, two, three, that the, the, whereas Marx's view is that when the parts join together as a whole, the whole is more than the sum of the parts. It attains um, qualities that the parts don't have in separation or by methods of simple addition. So this is a very, very widespread, uh, widespread view. Um, I mean, I'm doing a history PhD. My supervisor tells me, you cannot write this, oddly, chronologically. Mm. You cannot write a history PhD chronologically. You have to write it analytically. You have to write it as breaking down the elements that you're studying into fixed boxes, analyze the boxes, 
conclusion, box, 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 yeah, introduction, box, 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 conclusion. And very large parts of the way in which we think about the world are, are, are like this. Compartmentalization, which is entailed in this, is absolutely, is absolutely endemic. You know, if you read the newspaper, the unemployment figures are reported on the front page, the suicide rate on page six, but actually the two things are very closely, are very closely connected. Um, the art reviews will be on the arts page, but the art business will be reported in the business pages, despite the fact that everybody knows that these are very, very closely, uh, closely connected. If you, if you actually look at the career of any artist, the business of actually selling the paintings, the galleries, the promotion, the they're intimately connected, but that's not supposed to be the... the, the so this is, you know, this is the dominant methodology and the dominant ideology and that's why the idea of change of things coming into being and passing out of being of there being a fissure and contradiction and instability at the heart of the society is still a, a radical a, a radical idea um, I think Marxism develops because the society around it develops. It, you know, there are new challenges that come up, new theories that, that come up, but it depends in which, in which register you mean this. Um, Marxism or any other social theory can't leap over the particular historical stage of society that we're in. Now, capitalism, we're still in capitalist society. It changes to the degree that obviously the capitalism that we're in isn't the capitalism of the 17th century or the 18th century. And so, you know, there are necessarily social development which requires renewed analysis, which requires renewed application, which requires that different things be analysed. But we're not not in capitalism either. We haven't made a historical jump out of one particular form of society into another. Now, what lies on the other side of that jump, either in terms of socialism or in terms of development of philosophy of any kind, um, is impossible uh, to tell. You know, Engels, there's a famous thing where Engels says, look, <laughs> nobody in the future is going to give out, is going to care what we now think about the social structure of society on the other side. And we can't foresee it. And Marx and Engels were, were unlike the utopian socialists who were their contemporaries, were very uninterested in trying to imagine what that would, would, would be like. They thought that the business in hand was to, uh, was to analyse what the shape of the struggles were that could defeat this society, and that in the course of defeating this society and building a new society, people would have all sorts of social, cultural, um, emotional, uh, philosophical reactions to the society that we can't foresee precisely because just as no medieval monk in the 11th century could foresee what the modalities of life and philosophy will be in the 21st uh, century. That's a, that's a barrier that you can't penetrate and it, it's kind of, in a way, I think Mark Stengel's point was it's kind of wasted intellectual effort to try. On that, uh, um, did Lenin make any uh, contribution to this, these ideas, or did he? Because uh, I, I, I gather that he did have a conception of what socialism was, uh, and he wanted to uh, bring this into um, Russia at that time. That's what I gather. Um, I wonder whether he's taken Marx a bit further than perhaps Marx would have wanted to go. Chris, just on the issue of the development of philosophy or otherwise. There's a famous um, kind of aphorism that Marx uh, wrote in the thesis on the about, which is, um, which is on his grave actually, philosophers have interpreted the world, the point is to change it. And I, I actually think that's quite often misinterpreted because what, I, what he didn't mean, as I understand it, is forget philosophy, we just got to get on with being activists. What I think he meant was we need philosophy, but actually we need philosophy in order to change the world. And that philosophy is dry and empty if it's not part of the project of changing the world. And that we won't be able to change the world without philosophy. Um, at least in the sense of, um, certainly in the sense of a, having a dialectical understanding of the world. And if you think about it now, um, 
the standard kind of non-dialectical view of the world is that basically change happens piecemeal in an evolutionary way over time gradually that's the kind of normal account um, but actually that view I mean anyone who holds that view is completely at sea when faced with what is going on today because what has happened is that you know many of the sort of central elements of the dialectic are cleared for all to see Clearly capitalism is deeply contradictory. You can see that, that now. I mean, even, on the, even in the BBC, they have to talk about there being fundamental problems and conflicts at the heart of the system. A. B, those contradictions erupt. They don't kind of gradually unfold. They erupt in shocks and, you know, um, sudden leaps, as Lenin called it. Leaps, leaps, leaps. That's, what, that's, that's the way um, these contradictions, you know, they, they, in other words, the quantitative change reaches a point, point of qualitative shift where suddenly the, the tensions reach a point at which they have to kind of burst out uh, in a way. Um, and unless you, unless you have that dialectical understanding, unless you sort of have some sense of there being these, um, th this, this kind of dialectical uh, way that society develops, you, you, you're just completely lost in, in today's world. And you know, the reformists, the people who believe it's by piecemeal change, they've got no answers to these kind of, um, to these kind of massive shifts. So in other words, what I think the answer to Dan's point, or at least one answer to it, is to say, you know, it may be that the, the, philosoph the general philosophical kind of framework and method that Marx and that Hegel, and, that, sorry, that Marx developed and Lenin developed, maybe some more, uh, is, 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 you know, is, is, uh, has reached a certain point of development where, um, where maybe there won't be kind of big qualitative shifts in, in the method itself. But you need that philosophy, you need that dialectical method in order to understand the world and in order to change it. No, that was a useful series of clarifications. There are two dangers in terms of what John pointed out, and in general, it's just a question. John pointed out one of them, which is the compartmentalization of the academia thing, but there's a double, there's its, its mirror image, and it's just as problematic. Is, is to say, as what the, anti the antithesis of what Chris said, which is the idea that we just need activism, we just need, you know, enthusiasm, stuff like that. I mean, I, I was at a fantastic meeting last night, I don't know if you here, but it was the, um, John Carlos, the Olympic athlete, spoke at it, um, uh, the mother of Doreen Lawrence spoke at it, various other people, and I, it was maybe a thousand people in the room, it was, it was the testimonies about him, social injustice were fantastic and all the rest of it, but it really did strike me that it, this, it didn't have much to offer in terms of strategy in a sense. And I think this dialectical praxis, is, you know, the relationship between theory and practice is, needs to be kind of resuscitated on the left really, because I think there is a kind of ossification where people are, where there's a sense of where do we go next, and like, ideas that have worked for the last 10, 20 years to the activism don't seem to work anymore. You know? I, think it, I think we need to find ways really of, of getting that the balance right, of, of being philosophical, so to speak, of being, you know, of actually thinking, not being afraid to be intellectual about things, but also about making sure that when we're actually in and about the movement, we're actually talking about what Chris is saying, and really it boils down to is how do you do you, how do you respond to the kind of crises that are, uh, that are going on. So I guess in the phase of saying at the beginning, it'd be interesting to talk about what we want to do next. Um, how do you, you know, quite to know, maybe that's something we need to develop more, is how do we apply Marx's idea, how do we apply dialectics to the modern world? What is dialectical about the situation we're in now? What are the kind of contradictions in society right? Now, beyond the sort of obvious ones of class, you know, which you can point out, but I mean, maybe that is a way to go to think of how, to, maybe, to, uh, maybe a session on practice and this idea of how do you apply Marxism to immediately to the questions of today. So I think that's really something on the left that, you know, we, we need to really make quite a lot of headway in this, especially because there are people out there who need, you know, who want answers, who have answers, might have answers themselves, and need to be able to reach out to those people as well and, and actually be able to give direction to the movement.
Yeah, but well, partly with, about Lenny, because I mean, every time there's been a huge revolutionary uh, surge, um, these questions get thrown up. Um, because when this happens, um, even the certainties that revolutionaries have worked with over a period of time are swept away. And each time, with, with Marx and Engels themselves, um, uh, with Lenin and Trotsky after 1917, with George Lukács in the Hungarian Revolution in 1919, people go back to this. And they go back to it because when you've got a complex situation in front of you, you have to kind of relearn the fundamental method in order to deal with it because the old certainties and the old ways and the old analyses don't work anymore. Um, and that's why you get a kind of rebirth or refurbishment of, of, of these methods. And one of the points that was made in the discussion is, is, is absolutely critical. You see, we want to be careful. These are routine um, polarities, theory and practice, objectivity and subjectivity. They're routine uh, polarities. But they don't mean, in the Marxist tradition, quite what they would seem to mean, or the way sometimes even people who are Marxists talk about them, and certainly they don't mean what they would mean outside it. Um, and they don't mean it in this sense. You see, when Lenin, for instance, wrote that practice is higher than theory, did he mean that simply running around doing any old activity is better than sitting down and seriously trying to think about the world and the way it works and to apprehend it theoretically? Well, obviously not, because when the Second International um, voted for war credits, the collapse of the whole sort of international socialist movement at the beginning of the First World War, Lenin did an extraordinary thing. He didn't write a pamphlet about this, uh, well, he did write some pamphlets about this, but the main thing he did was he went into the library in Bern, in Switzerland, where he was in exile, and he read Hegel's Science of Logic and made a notebook this thick, printed, when it's printed, it's this thick, um, on this question because he understood that when something complex was in front of you, you had to analyze it theoretically, and even refurbish your theoretical tools before you analyzed it theoretically. The reading and rereading of Hegel became before his book, Imperialism, The Highest Stage of Capitalism, and it was a result, partly a result of, of, of that. So he certainly didn't mean when he said that practice is higher than theory, that theory was unimportant. What he meant was that practice isn't the opposite of theory, it is theoretically informed activity. That's what practice means in the, in the Marxist definition. It is not any old activity you like. It is a theoretically informed practical intervention in the world, which parks us right back to the definition of conscious labor. You know, when we talk about the art, Marx talks about the architect and the bin. Obviously, what you're doing when you try to build a house according to plan is you're engaged in a theoretically informed practical activity, not kind of, way. Well, let's just nail a plank to go in the old way that you like. It's, there's a conscious direction to it. And political practice, all sorts of practice, is that. It's, it's theoretically informed activity. It's a fusion of theory and practice, not that those two are alternatives. And the same is true when you hear the phrases of the objective world and the subjective world. You know, conventionally, subjective is what goes on in your mind or what is going on in the consciousness of many minds. That's subjective, malleable, subject to change. The objective world is the natural world or the landscape or the economic system or the institutions of society which are relatively unchanging and stable and immutable. But that isn't the polarity, that conventional notion isn't the polarity um, that Marxists are working with. Because if you operate with that polarity, you get um, two wrong poles reinforcing each other. You get a subjective who says, yes, we can do it, yes, we can change it, yes, we can change it. An objective who says, no, you can't, no, you can't, you can't, it's always going to be like this. And there's no way out of this circle. They are mutually reinforcing wrong poles because they are undialectical. Um, and Lenin, when he was attacking determinism, the view that the simple objectivity, gives a very good, I'll just read it out because it's very good. It says, the objectivist, i.e. something you just believe in the objective economic development of society, what we might call a determinist or a reductionist, says, the objectivist speaks of the necessity of a given historical protest, the materialist, which 
Lenin means here a dialectician, a Marxist in this sense. The materialist gives an exact picture of a given socio-economic formation and of the antagonistic relations to which it gives rise. When demonstrating the necessity of a given series of facts, the objectivist always runs the risk of becoming an apologist for these facts. The materialist discloses the class contradictions and in defining his standpoint gives the possibility of change. The materialist would not content himself with stating insurmountable historical tendencies, but would point to the existence of certain classes which determine the content of a given system and preclude the possibility of any solution except by the action of the producers themselves. Materialism includes partisanship, so to speak, and enjoins the direct and open <coughs> adoption of a standpoint of a definite social group in any assessment of events. In other words, in this view, subject, subjectivity enters into the chain of objective development. There isn't just an economic crisis, an austerity policy by the government, uh, cuts to the welfare services, uh, grinding poverty, whatever, whatever. There isn't just that objective chain of events. There is a subjective reaction. What are political parties, trade unionists, militants, socialists going to do? This enters into that objective chain of events and will determine, or partly determine, their, their outcome. And when Marxists are analysing things, they're looking not just at the abstractions, there are classes, there is a contradiction between <coughs> classes, there is a capitalist crisis. They're seeking to be more specific than that so that the abstractions don't disguise the reality. They're saying, there's not just a Tory government, it's this particular kind of Tory government, which is the same as the Thatcher government, but different from it in important respects. Weaker, not so able to rely on its own forces, in coalition with the Liberals, and therefore different from, although the same as, in a certain way, what preceded it. There is a trade union movement, but the trade union movement is specific to this. It's not the same as it was in the 1970s in this, this, and this way. There is a left, and the left can react to these things in this way or in that way. So you get a whole picture of an objective series of events, but into which the idea of subjective organisation, ideology, uh, strategies for change is inserted as part of the process of, that you're analysing and therefore becomes a conscious activity, becomes a, a practice. Um, I've got a question just in relation to that, and then I'll take Maya. So where does that kind of leave objectivity? Is there, like, is there, is it, is it just a kind of fusion of subjectivity and objectivity? Is it just a sort of dialectical unity? Or is there anything, is there anything that you can say is objective, like nature or being, you know? Um, uh, yeah, in a slightly similar way, you, you mentioned earlier this kind of the static notion of, of the state and how that becomes inapplicable, and likewise, you have a static notion of uh, human nature taken in a very individualistic and competitive, uh, absolute kind of way, which informs a neoclassical analysis of, of human behaviour and, and economics as well. Could you talk a little bit about the alternative Hegelian Marxist kind of social conception of human nature and what the consequences uh, of that are uh, as far as? applying it practically to social mobilisation in segments of society that are not particularly embedded in the movement uh, at present. Just on your question about objectivity and subjectivity, I mean, I think there, there is such a thing as objectivity. There is the real world, but we are part of it. <coughs> Um, and we human beings are a unique part of the objective world in that we have consciousness and um, therefore um, subjectivity and objectivity are not two completely separate things and the question then is how do we presumably the question then is how do we understand how do we um, measure the you know um, the world how do we how do we grasp the reality of the world of this interconnected world that, that this, this sort of totality that John talked about and um, this was actually a very important thing that, that um, was important for me in realising is that it's, it's, it's through uh, practice that actually we understand the world it's through a combination of practice and then the, um, the, the kind of um, 
consideration of practice, the analysis of the results of practice, that that, w that we can get, we can gain the sense of uh, of actually how you know the real nature of the totality. Marx said the question of the, the rightness or wrongness of a particular notion is not a scholastic question. It's not something that you can end, you know, to go back to the Socratic thing, you can't actually decide what is true and what is not true by debate. In the end of the day, you debate, you develop your concepts and then you test them, you engage them in the real world. And it's through that process of, of developing concepts, testing them in the real world and then reassessing the concepts that you come towards you move towards a greater understanding of the totality of which you are a part. And that's really the, you know, that's, that's I think, the, 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 the relationship between objectivity and subjectivity is actually something that's worked out in practice, funnily enough. It's, it's something that comes out of, um, of, 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 of activity, labour, but not just labour. In the end of the day, it comes out of struggle. And it's... The crucial thing is that it's in the process of struggling to change the world that you actually really get the most fundamental understanding of, of the way it is. Contradictions aren't, ne that was, um, aren't necessarily don't necessarily exist. Dialectic doesn't ne does it work in you know, nuclear physics. I mean, because it's it's about it's about a social problem that you can see you can sort of see where you can see because you can see each side who has a problem and, what, and who you know someone's problem is created by solving another person's problem under capitalism. You know, cap capitalists get lots of money. That's their problem solved, they can exist, they can do what they want. It creates another problem for another bunch of people. So that's a reality, that's an objective fact. And the question is, can you change that? And it seems to me that it's only, like John saying, it's asking those kind of questions about can you change it, you end up talking about dialectics at all. You know, it's, a, it's, it's probably something more to do with human nature, what, we, what, the, what the possibilities are. Because you know, in a, in a ping pong ball we're talking about, there aren't any other possibilities other than these terms because the ping pong balls can't make decisions. Whereas people playing ping pong can make decisions. So it, that just creates dialectics in the market sense is really talking about just a problem we know it, we can see exists. And it, you know, if you can't see a problem, it's probably you know what it is. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, for everyday purposes, you know, we're pretty clear what is objective, what is relatively unamenable to change, and um, and what and what we can change. But it's very important to, to have a sense that what is objective can change over time. Uh, at the moment, the forces of the state in this country are pretty much an objective fact for the left. We can go out tonight and try and launch an insurrection, but I suspect we find that the forces of the state are an objective reality for us and we'll all end up in prison. Um, but um, for the Egyptians on the 25th of February and the days afterwards, um, the state was no longer an objective fact with which they were confronted. It, it had become malleable, it had become fluid, it had become a subject to change and was directly related to their subjectivity, their conscious and political consciousness. It became something which uh, was, it was suddenly possible, at least in part, and potentially possible as a whole, uh, that this would no longer be an objective fact in Egyptian, uh, in Egyptian society. Very important parts of it simply dissolved in front, in front of them. The economic system, as it exists at the moment, is for us an objective fact. You know, I'm, a, as a matter of fact, um, a, a Republican, and I, I don't like the fact that the Queen's head is on all the currency uh, in, in this country. I have other plans for the Queen's head. 
Um, and then, but there's no point in me going into the shop and making this point to the shopkeeper and saying, hey, look, I'm terrible, sorry, I'm not using this rubbish, it's got the Queen's head on it, I'd really rather do something else. Um, but of course, in the English Revolution in the 17th century, when they cut off the King's head, they then produced a currency which doesn't have him on it any longer. So, you know, those things, that, you know, the, 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 the fluidity of social institutions um, is obvious, dependent on the, uh, the capability of people uh, and the capacity of people, the scale of the change um, and the resources that people have to, uh, to do it. Um, the natural world is also like this, and uh, it's like in relationship to, to, to human beings. You know, um, it, it wasn't possible at a certain point in human development to manipulate the genetic structure of crops. It is now, but whatever you think about this, for good or ill, that is now a human, uh, a human possibility. Last week, um, they um, uh, teleported a photon over 30 miles. Uh, which opens up the possibility of being eventually able to beam me up scoffing um, of teleportation. That, that's a bending of the, of, 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 the, of, of the natural world, which was previously an absolutely objective fact for human beings into something which is entering the realm of subjectivity um, for, uh, for, for human beings. So, you know, that, that's, I guess that's the point about the static conceptions of, of, of the human structure. And, and Mark things were very clear that human beings were both part of, had in, in essence a dialectical relationship to the natural world. They were both part of it, but separate from it. They emerged from it. You know, there wasn't human consciousness at a certain point in history, and then there was. Um, there wasn't the capacity to stand up right at a certain to model which are much closer to the sort of fundamental ideas of dialectics. And some of them, like Stephen Rose, it, um, like the biologist Levins and the Wanting, are consciously working with a Marxist model. So there is a very, very good short book called The, the Doctrine of DNA by Levins and the Wanting, which, ex which explains the way the natural scientists are working with it. And the dialectical biologist does the same thing. And Stephen Rose's books about the brain do the same, uh, do the same thing uh, as well. Dan was suggesting about applying the dialectic. Do you want to say something more about that? And if anyone has any other ideas or comments? Well, we started, 